We have a very special, he's not a guest, he's part of our family. He has an amazing testimony. And as long as I've known him, he has such a humble heart. He really has such a loving heart. I consider him like a, he's, he's like a, he could be like our Christian grandpa. I'll just put it that way. Full of love. Now I don't mean no offense, no offense. He doesn't look like it, but, but he's so full of love. He's so full of wisdom. And how many know sometimes we just need to sit back, stop talking and receive some wisdom. You know what I mean? Some of us have made some bad choices in life. Anybody like me made some bad choices? I see this side of the room made bad choices. This side's perfect, must be. I'm just kidding. We've all made, but sometimes we just need to hear a word from God. Well, I believe God's going to use this man of God. He's the associate pastor of our Arrowhead campus, coming all the way from San Bernardino, California. Let's give it up for Pastor Willie Uliberry. Come on, let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> How many happy to be in the house of the Lord? You say, we're not inside, but this is God's house. He created all. I said, how many are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of the Lord. If you're excited about what Jesus has done in your life, you need to give him a gay praise offering tonight. Oh, that was weak. I said, you need to give him a good praise offering tonight. I want to challenge you with something tonight. I want you to yell so loud that I want them to hear you at the Arrowhead campus. And then Pastor Joe said, what was going on up there? I said, the power of the Holy Spirit is here at the Hallmark campus. Come on, can you do that? Give the Lord another shout. Amen. If we are all reminded what God has done in our lives, what he's brought us from, what he's delivered us from, what he set us free from. We ought to shout and jump all day long. Amen? I said we ought to shout and jump all day long. Amen? How many of you have been set free? I said how many have been set free in Jesus' name? How many of you have been set free? Give the Lord another good praise offering tonight. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and let's just ask God to be with us tonight. As we look at his word, there's nothing greater than looking at God's word. So how many enjoy God's word? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness and your mercy. We're so grateful, God, that each and every one of us stand here tonight with a story. Each and every one of us have a journey that we've been through, Father God. But it's not about the journey, but it's about the destination. And our destination is found in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we're so grateful and we're so thankful that we can sit here tonight, Father God, and we can just... Be in your presence and allow you, Father God, to minister to each and every one of us, Lord. We ask you right now to speak to our hearts, to speak to our souls, and to speak to us, Father God, that we can be formed and shaped and transformed to do what you would have us to do to bring honor and glory to your name and to turn San Bernardino right side, right side up for Jesus. In Jesus' name, we thank you. And everyone said, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and give your neighbor a high five tonight. Amen. Father, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be here with you tonight. Usually I'm at the Arrowhead campus on Wednesday nights, but we're excited that we can be here and share what God has done in our lives. It's amazing when we look back to what God has done in our lives, sometimes we become overwhelmed. But I want to talk to you tonight about being lost, but then being found. How many of you have ever lost anything? Three of you, okay. I said, how many of you have ever lost anything? And the crazy thing about some of you lost your keys before you came to church tonight, right? Some of you lost your way on the way to the Hallmark campus tonight, didn't you? It's crazy because when we lose something, we begin to have this anxiety, and we begin to say, what am I going to do without the thing that I lost? But I'm here to tell you tonight that when we find something, there's a joy that comes in our heart. So I want to share with you tonight from the book of Luke chapter 15. And in the book of Luke chapter 15, I call it the lost and found chapter of the Bible. And what it is, there's a, three parables that Jesus speaks about, about an individual or things or an animal being lost. 
And it's amazing because when he begins to share these parables or stories, he begins to identify some very specific things that happen when something was lost and when they get found. First of all, the first one is the lost sheep. How many know the story of the lost sheep? There was a, out there in the fields and they were uh, tending the sheep. And as they were tending the sheep, one of them got lost. We all know the story. And it says that he left the 99 to find the one. Woo! Oh, come on now. How many know that you were the one that Jesus found? I said, how many know you were the one that Jesus found? It says he left the 99 to go find you. Turn to your neighbor and say, he found you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, he found you too. Aren't you lucky? So the sheep, so he left the 99 to find the one. So when you look at that in the percentages, it's 1%. That's how much matters to God. And then the second story talks about the woman who lost the coin. It was a silver coin. She lost this coin, and she was desperate. It said that she got the vacuum cleaner, she got the mop, she got the broom, she got the Windex, she got the Lysol, she got the furniture polish, and she cleaned the whole house. She was cleaning her house because she wanted to find that lost coin. And guess what she did? She found it. You think she was excited about that? Yes, she was. But the amazing thing that when we hear these three stories of something being lost and found, the third one being the prodigal son, and that's what we're going to touch on. But the key thing about these three stories, at that the end of everything being lost and then being found, it says that they had a feast. In other words, let me phrase it for you. They had a comida. We're going to have a comida afterwards. What are we serving afterwards, Pastor Christian? A hot dog, okay? That's a comida. But they said they were so excited that they wanted to celebrate that they had found the lost thing. I'm here to tell you tonight that there are some people that are here tonight that have been lost and you're wandering around and you came here tonight and you are going to be found. Jesus is going to find you and add him, add you to his kingdom. So we're going to celebrate that you have been found. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's a time to celebrate. You see, we tend to get all caught up sometimes in everything that we lose. But I'm so thankful that Jesus found me. I'm so grateful that he loved me enough to look down and find me. So what we see going on here is Jesus is sharing about these lost things. And when I look at this story of the prodigal son, my own journey mirrors the story of the prodigal son. It's a tale of wandering. How many have ever wandered? Ooh, I think, how many have ever wandered? Some of you ain't being honest. You're still wandering right now. That's why. We're wandering. But then there was repentance. And then there was this overwhelming grace of God. So open up your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones, whatever it is, to Luke chapter 15. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to break it down in pieces for us tonight so we can have an understanding of what's going on here. So when we look at Luke 15... Verses 11 through 12, it says this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. How many of you like hearing stories? Three of you. Okay, that's good. Let me move on. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, okay, there's something wrong right there right now. There's something wrong. The young son told his father. How many of you ever told your father what to do. Let me see your hand. Yeah. Okay. A couple of you are still alive. Still alive okay. Said so he told his father. That's really, really interesting to me. And I want to, he said, told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between the sons. So what happened is this son, he had a master plan for his life. How many of you have a master plan for your life? How many of you decided what you want to do in five years, in two years, in ten? You have an idea. You have a plan. Maybe you're going to finish your education. Maybe you're going to get a job. Maybe there's various things that you want to do. Well, this son had a master plan for his life, and he had three steps. Let me give you his three steps. The first step was this. Get a bunch of money. How many get a bunch of money people do we have in the house tonight? Okay, good. That's good. Amen. The second was, was leave home. 
How many were anxious to leave home when you did? A couple of you say, yeah, I need to get out of here real quick. And the third one is this. He goes, first of all, I want to get a bunch of money. I want to leave home. And then I want to do whatever I want to do the rest of my life. How many have ever wanted to do whatever you want to do the rest of your life? Some of you left the house when you did because you were tired of being under the rules and regulations. You were tired of being under restrictions. And so you said this, I can hardly wait to get out of here. And you got out of there and you left and you were wandering around aimlessly because you didn't know what to do. And then you were in a situation and a circumstance and you started to cry, Mama. How many cried for Mama? Yeah, you ain't going to admit it. Okay, that's all right. We'll keep moving on here. So he said, I'm going to do all this. This is the plan for my life. So he says to his father, give me a share of the property that is coming to me. Basically, he says this, can we just pretend you're dead? What happened in here? Because this was his inheritance. And an inheritance isn't given until the person dies. But this guy was so desperate to get on with his life that he said, Daddy, just pretend, can we pretend you're dead so I can get the inheritance? Man, is that cold-blooded or what? He says, I want my fortune now. Give me the share. I want it now. You see, folks, selfishness causes us to focus more on our own sinful desires. How many selfish people we have in the house? You ain't going to raise your hand now. Yeah, we get selfish sometimes. Focus on our own desires instead of wanting the gifts God has for us in our relationship with him. The younger son wanted the father he wanted all the father's stuff. He wanted everything the father could give him. But he did not want a relationship with the father. Wow. A lot of times we come to church to get everything that we can from the church. We come to church to get the free gifts. We come to church to get that, whatever, this, that, and the other thing. The area campus, some come to church to get the food, to get the clothes. But a lot of times when you get and talk to them, they want all the stuff, but they don't want the father. And I'm here to tell you. When you exclude the father from the equation, you're always going to be in a mess. But when you include the father in the equation, he said, I'll give back to you. Press down, shaken together and running over. I will bless your life like it's never been blessed before. I will open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour a blessing on you that you cannot even contain it. Come on, say amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to interweave my story along with the prodigal son story. You see, from the beginning of my life, it was marked by God's grace. As a newborn baby, I spent the first few weeks of my life in an oxygen tent fighting for survival. My, lamb, my lungs were damaged. I couldn't breathe, so they put me in an oxygen tent. And during that time, people were coming to see me, and my grandfather came in to see me. My grandfather was a pastor. He was an evangelist. To this day, it was known that he planted and started over 20 churches in the tenure of his ministry. And he had walked into that hospital room. And he looked at me in the oxygen tent. And he lifted up the tent and he pulled me out of the tent. And everyone started getting crazy. What's going on? What's going on? Picked me up and he lifted me up. And he prayed out to God. He said, God, spare his life and take me instead. I was spared like the prodigal son. Here I am, amen. But I would later find myself making selfish choices. Choices that were selfish. Choices that were not pleasing to God. So then what begins to happen in Luke chapter 15, verse 13 and 16, it talks about the young son. But what happened here is he had a reality check, uh-oh, What's a reality check? A reality check. Some of you, God had to put you in check to get you out of the mess you were in. Say amen. amen. We don't like being in a reality check. 
You know, we got to get right with God if we want to be blessed by God. We got to stop playing church if we want to be blessed by God. We got to stop pretending that everything's okay if we want to get blessed by God. We got to stop pretending that we love our wife or we love our family. We got to stop all these things. And there's a time when God needs to give us a reality check. Where are we? Where are you tonight, church? So where are you tonight? So he began to go out there, and he got his stuff, and he left, and the son gets just what he wants. But he found out that all the glitter is not gold. Come on now. It's all food. It's not. The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. When I jumped the fence, the grass was dead. And there was weeds, and it was jacked up. So the prodigal son had a reality check. He spent and wasted all his inheritance on rowdy, crazy living. Uh-oh. How many have ever had a, or lived a rowdy, crazy life? Let me see your hand. Mm-hmm. How many of you spent more than you should have spent in that rowdy, crazy life? How many are thankful God delivered you from that rowdy? Come on, you ought to shout louder than that. Man, that's a reason to shout Hallelujah. But what happens with this crazy living and we were experiencing the temporary pleasures of sin before facing the harsh realities of separation, of sorrow, and of shame. And it says that he went out and he lost everything, so he got a job feeding the pigs. Now, this was a very, very humiliating position for a Jewish man, but he had to do what he had to do. I'm here to tell you, the seasons of life will change. Let me say that again. The seasons of life will change. And when they do, everything that brought you pleasure at one point in your life will now bring you pain instead. Oh, my, my, my. A life lived in the bottle. A life indulging in sexual sins. A life filled with fleshly pleasure, slamming dope, smoking weed, doing lines. Come on now. A life lived for yourself. All these end up in the same place. Yes, pleasure may be found in these things for a short time, folks, but it's an eternity without God, and you'll be living in hell. Is that time, I mean, living without God, is it worth it being in hell the rest of your life? No, it's not. So we need to understand, what does a sin bring? A sin brings us separation. How many have been separated because of sin? Sin brings us shame. Sin brings us suffering. How many have suffered because of the sin in your life? Sin brings us sorrow. How many have had sorrow because of the sin in your life? It pays to live for God. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, live for God the rest of your life. You see, sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you there longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin will do to you. Wow. So after high school, I got married. The following year, we were blessed with our first child. But life was difficult. My own selfishness, my poor choices, including infidelity, led to separation and on the brink of divorce. I found myself entangled in the pleasures of this world. Drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, gambling. Much like the prodigal son, I was lost, I was broken, and I was far from God. So as we look at Luke chapter 15, 17, and 20, sometimes we need a change of scenery. Sometimes we need a lifestyle change. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. How many of you needed a wake-up call in your life? And when he finally came to his senses, you know what it means to come to your senses? It means to get to wise up. It means this, stop acting a fool. So stop acting a fool, fool. Come on now. 
And that's what happens. We think we're all that in a bag of chips and we acting crazy and we think we're invincible. We think God got the whole world by the, the hand and we think, okay, we can take care of all this stuff. And we start acting crazy. But here this young son said, man, I'm in a mess right now. I need a change in my life. I'm going to go to the Way World Outreach and I'm going to go there and I'm going to give my life to Jesus and I'm going to get baptized in water. And after I get baptized in water, I'm going to join Holy Water. I'm going to join Holy Warriors. One, two, three, four, five, six, 29, whatever it takes. Then after I do that, I'm going to get into DG. And after I get into DG, then I'm going to go to LU. And then after I do, I'm going to start my own DG. And I'm going to join the Dr. Block. I'm going to go out door to door, start telling Jesus, start telling everybody what Jesus did for my life. He took me from where I was. He gave me a reality check. And so today I can stand up and I can shout hallelujah I'm free I'm free I'm free wow a wake up call some of you need a wake up call tonight come on now he was tired of being with the pigs wow as I was going through all these things in my life I had a wake up call a turning point in my life came when my mother my mother my mother got ill Loved her dearly. Never want to lose a mom. And she died of cancer at the age of 46. And I thought my life was over. Wow. Her sickness and her death shook me to the core. My wife and I, our ch small children were living here in California. Mom and dad were back in Colorado. I get a phone call. My dad says, your mom's sick. You need to get out of here. She just spent the Christmas before with us. I go, but she was doing okay. She goes, she's not doing good. You need to get out of here now. And my dad was broken. I'll never forget. I was so upset. I went outside in the driveway of my house. We were living in Ontario at that time. And I stood in the middle of the driveway. And I yelled at the top of my voice, God, if you let my mom die, I don't want everything, anything to ever do with you again. I don't want nothing to do if you let my mom die. We jumped on a plane. We flew to Colorado. We got there. We went to the hospital. She was laying in the bed, and she had been in and out. She'd been, un un she'd been unconscious, and, and then I walked in, and she opened up her eyes. We began to look at her, and I began to talk to her. I said, Mom, what's going on? Mom, what do you want? Mom, what do you want? She goes, Son, I asked God for three things before I leave. I said, No, Mom, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I need you, Mom. She goes, I asked God for three things. He answered two of them, but he hasn't answered the third one yet. I go, what is the third one? That you dedicate your life and surrender your life to God and answer the call that he's given you. She should have just reached up and ripped the heart of my heart out of my chest. I went back to the house that I was raised in, went to my old bedroom, and I laid on the floor. I was prostrate before God. I lay in a sense of humbleness. I hadn't faced down. And I was sitting there. Now you need to realize that when I went back there, I was on drugs. I was on the alcohol. I had a gambling addiction. I had all this craziness that was going on in my life. I laid down on the floor of my whole bedroom and I cried out to God. I said, God, I remember when I was young and I went to Sunday school. I remember some of these things that I heard. God, if it's true and if you're for real, God, I need you to visit me. I need you to to come and deliver me right now I'm here to tell you right now folks I had an encounter with Jesus Christ I had a breakthrough with Jesus Christ he came he delivered me he set me free and I got a knock on the door and I go who it is who is it and it was Anna my wife and she came in she goes what are you doing I go I'm getting my life right with Jesus she laid down right next to me, and we both rededicated our lives, gave our hearts to the Lord. Look what the Lord has done. I tell everybody, I never went to AA, I never went to NA, but I went to JC, and he set me free. Come on, shout glory. If I could run, I'd run around this place right now. Because it's amazing that when we commit ourselves to God, I went back to the hospital the following morning. They had a code blue, so we went back in there. Mom would go in and out. 
I walked in, and every time Anna and I walked in, she would open up her eyes. I walked in, and she opened up her eyes. I go, Mom. And she, I could tell she was at the end. I go, Mom, you don't have to worry about me anymore. Because from this day forward, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we have served the Lord ever since. Wow. Like the prodigal son, I realized that the foolishness of my ways made me to return to the Father. He was there with open arms. And the last thing I want to share with you today, and this story, it's in Luke 15, 20 and 24. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him. And kissed him. And as you look at the story, the son decided to go back and he was contemplating what is it going to be like? What's going to happen? So there was this reunion. How many of you like reunions? So that's the fourth point, reunited. Now I was thinking a couple of songs about reunited. But I don't know if I can share more than here right now. Come on now. And so what happened is there was a reunion that took place. You see, he realized that he needed to change. He realized he needed to get right. He realized what he was doing right now, that he was out in the streets. He was in the gutters. He was slamming dope. He was drinking. He realized that that wasn't going to work anymore. And he realized that if he stood doing that, that his destination was not going to be with the father. So he got up and he went to his father. Some of you need to get up. Some of you need to stand up today for the first time. Some of you need to come run into this altar. You need to come run into the Father. Some of you that haven't been in church and you've been playing the game. Uh, stop, stop playing games. Get serious with God starting today. You need to run to the Father. So he ran to the Father and he was a far way off. But it was so amazing that the Father was looking for him. He was longing. I believe our Heavenly Father, He's looking and longing for us that are not saved, for you that are not saved, for us that are playing games with you. He longs for us to come back to Him. And what's so amazing about the Father, He loves us. In spite of yourself, He loves you. I'm here to tell you there's some in this place tonight that are unlovable. Don't say amen, wife. There are some here tonight that are unlovable. Come on. There are some here tonight that need compassion. Jesus will give you compassion through his grace when we receive him. It was amazing because when the son got received, his father was so happy. The father ran to him. Now, if you look at this, you look at some of the contextual history of, running, of a father running to a family member. That was totally considered undignified for a man to run in that culture. You can't be running. That's undignified. I ain't got time to get in all that. But what happens when the father saw him, what did the father do? Yeah, he ran to him. And then what did he do next? Vessel, vessel, vessel. I said he didn't give him. He said he kissed him with many kisses. He's seen him when you embrace someone and you kiss him. I have a, a new little great-granddaughter. Yeah, I'm not that old, though, to have a granddaughter. I'm your great-granddaughter. I'm a grandpa. I'm a great-grandpa. Thank you, Christian. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so my little great-granddaughter, she's just uh, like 14 months old. And she comes to the house and she leaves and, and she goes, bye. Bye. And then she goes, she starts throwing kisses. You know, there's something about love that will cause us to embrace that will cause us to kiss. I remember we were at the L.A. County Fair, Pomona Fair, if you will, back then. And we were sitting there. How many have ever been to the L.A. County Fair? How many spent too much money at the L.A. County Fair? How many when you went, it was too hot? Yeah, we went one time. It was too hot. Our son was little. Our daughter was little. We were sitting there, and we were going through all the booths, and you, know, you get all uh, captivated by what's in the booths. And so we're moving along with the crowd. We're moving along with the crowd, moving along with the crowd. And I look down, and I go, where's our son? And my wife goes, I thought you had him. I said, I thought you had him. No one had him. And we were set, but we took, it took us three hours. 
We look for him. I went to the bathrooms. I ran there. You're talking about desperation. I think sometimes that's how the Lord feels. He's desperate. He wants us to come to him because he created us in his own image. And he loves us unconditionally. Thank God he loves you unconditionally. Amen. And so we were sitting there and finally we looked around. We talked to security. We did all this stuff. And they said, just go to the security booth. Stay there. Maybe with someone will show up with him. And Anna and I were freaking out. Someone took our son. So you start going through all this process. How are we going to live without our son? What are we going to do? You're talking about feeling guilty. You talk about feeling worthless as a dad. So we're sitting there. We don't know what to do. And then a little while later, we see him afar off. I seen him coming. And he was coming with a lady. I'm going, I knew someone took him. And he's walking up with the lady, and he sees us, and I see him, and, and he starts running. And I started running, and I was running behind me, and we got him. The first thing I did is I picked him up. I started kissing him with all the dry mocos on his face from crying. It didn't matter. And I kissed him because I was happy to see him. This is what this father did with his son. He kissed him. But then he found restoration. It is awesome that God restores back to us everything that we lost. Everything that we spent. He goes, I'm going to give it back to you. Trust me. I will give you everything back. How many know without a shadow of a doubt that when you came to Jesus, he blessed you. He restored you. He smiled upon you. He gave you grace. Oh, there's something about restoration. And the amazing thing about it, and the Bible goes on to say that, he gave him a robe. You know what the robe signifies? It signifies purity. When a sinner comes home, according to Isaiah 61.10, it says when a sinner comes home, they receive a robe of righteousness from their heavenly Father. Come on, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Then after the robe came the ring. You know what the ring is? It's privileges. The ring was a symbol of sonship and authority. And then the third thing, he said he gave him shoes. That signified or symbolized position. Because back in those days, only slaves were barefoot. Sons and daughters of the king wore shoes. Woo! What do you have on tonight? Are you a son and daughter of the king? Come on, shout glory. Come on, shout glory tonight. Come on, shout glory. Don't let the devil and your flesh keep you down by telling you that you are not worthy enough to be a child of God. I'm here to tell you tonight, you are more than worthy to be a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then at the end of that whole thing, what happened? He found rejoicing. The end of my story. My God, His grace was evident in my life. Just before my divorce was to be finalized, my wife and I decided to give our marriage another chance. We've been separated for six months. It was ugly. She hated me. Didn't blame her. I still loved her. She said, You liar. She hated me. My son had fallen hit the coffee table, cut his head open. She called me up and said, our son fell and he wants to see you. But he can't go anywhere because he's on medication. He has stitches, but you can come to the house if you want to. You come to the house if you want to and I'll fix something to eat and you can spend time with your son. I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, what's this all about? So I roll up to the house. Um, I'm looking everywhere, behind me, in front of me, beside me. I had my running shoes on. I had my nunchucks in my pants. I had my shuriken stars in my other hand. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. For whatever's going to go down, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'll figure time for you. She's going to try to eliminate me. Eliminate me. I knock on the door. And, no. She says, come in. I fixed your dinner. It's in the kitchen. So I went in and spent some time with my son. And she goes, Willie, 
what are you going to do when the divorce is over? I go, well, I'm actually moving to California. I already got a plane ticket. I'm moving to California. It was a long, longer conversation. I'm just kind of short. And she goes, why are you moving to California? I go, because I need to get my life right with Jesus. I go, we're done. I understand that. But I have a son. And you're pregnant with our daughter. If anything, I want to be a good father to my kids. She goes, do you really mean that? I say, yeah, I mean it. She goes, are you sure? I go, yeah. She goes, if you're willing to change, I might be willing to go with you to California. Four seconds later, I picked myself up off the floor because I knew she couldn't stand me. So we stood up that whole night talking about what it would look like, what it would be. And I'm not talking, there was some good conversation. Then it was not good at times. Before we knew it, the morning came. It was Saturday morning. So I said, okay, we're going to try to make this work. I pick up the phone. I call my attorney. I go, hey, Mr. Attorney, I just want to let you know that you lost the case. He goes, what? I go, you lost the case. Anna and I decided to make this work. And he goes, that's all I ever wanted for you in the first place. He goes, a matter of fact, Willie, I'm going to be at the office at noon. Meet me at the office, and I'll refund back to you all the money you paid me for the divorce proceedings to move you and your family to California. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering. I said, come on, give the Lord a praise offering. Give the Lord a praise. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, my goodness. But when we trust him and when we run back to him, he'll do things for us that we ever even, even thought he wouldn't do. So I'm here to tell you, next month, Next month, my wife and I will be celebrating our 49th year of marriage. Woo! Come on. One more year and it'll be 50. Everyone asks me, how was it? What was your marriage like? I go, it's been the best 49 years of her life. Just don't ask her. And then after that, we got into ministry. Things began to just go. So we've been in full-time ministry for 41 years. We've pastored, we've been associate pastors, children pastors. God has afforded us the opportunity. We've been to 32 different countries doing ministry, winning souls, baptizing people, implementing, starting, and establishing ministry. I'm here to tell you, had we not could learn to realize to run back into the loving arms of God, I would not be standing here today. So we need to thank God. Come on, stand to your feet with me tonight. Let's give the Lord a praise offering tonight. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you tonight. Some of you are running the wrong way. How many of you need, are here tonight that need a breakthrough in your life right now? Let me see your hand. How many need a breakthrough in your life right now? Come on. I mean, you, you need God to do something in your life right now today. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you tonight. I said, raise your hand. How many are here tonight that don't even know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? But tonight, I want to introduce you to my best friend, the one who set me free, the one who delivered me from alcohol, the one who delivered me from drugs, the one who delivered for all these things, the one who restored my marriage, the one who did a... How many here tonight say, I need some of that in my life? I need Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Let me see your hand. If that's you tonight, you need to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. I see your hand, young man. I don't even want to ask you to come. I want you to come right now. Come on. You know you need Jesus. Just come up here right now. Come on. Our ministry is going to meet you here. Our ministry team. Come up here right now. You raise your hand. You need a breakthrough. You need God to restore your marriage. Come on. Come up here right now. We want to pray with you. You need a God to set your life free. Come up here right now. You need to be delivered for drugs and alcohol. Come up here right now. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Come up here right now. You see, the Lord is standing up here with his arms wide open, ready to receive you. Why do you keep shunning him? Why do you keep stiff-arming God? He loves you unconditionally. I know there's more of you out there. Some of you having struggles in your marriage right now. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come on up here. How you doing, brother? Come on up here. Some of you are dealing with 
vices in your life right now. You need to come up here. Come on, there's more people coming. Come on, I see you coming from the back. Make your way up. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come forward. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come forward. Come on, give them a hand. Come on, we need some praying with these ladies right here. Anyone else? Pastor Willie, I need a breakthrough. Pastor Willie, I need things to happen in my life like here. Pastor Willie, how did you do it? I'm going to tell you how I did. I surrendered to God. Some of you need to come here and surrender to God. Stop surrendering to all the wrong things. Come on now. I'm going to give you a few more minutes. There's some more out there. You need to make your way up here. Jesus loves you tonight. Jesus loves you tonight. Amen. Amen. Come on, listen. All, 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 of you, all of you that are out there, extend your hands towards this altar tonight. Come on, extend your hands. Start praying for these individuals. If you have a family member, someone standing next to you that you know needs Jesus, that needs a breakthrough, bring them up here. Come on, bring them up here. Just grab them by the hand and bring them up here. If they're afraid to come by their self, grab them by the hand and bring them up here. This could be a night that their names would be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life that they never more have to worry about anything because if God be for them, nothing or anybody or anything can ever be against them. Come on, bring them up. Thank you, young men, for coming up. Thank you for being bold. Come on, there's some more of you. Come on. Yes, bring them up. Grab them by the hand. Bring them up here. Come on, grab them by, grab them by the hand. Bring them up here. Any more? Yeah, I see you coming from the back. Come on, make your way up. There you go. Come on, make your way up. Yeah, Jesus loves you. He sure does. He sure does. He sure loves you. Come on now. Anyone else? I'm going to wait for you. Grab them by the hand. Bring them up. Man, this is a big difference tonight into someone's life. This is a breakthrough in someone's life. This is a victory in someone's life. Anyone else need to be up here? Come on, I'm going to wait for you. Because after you accept the Lord, then we're going to baptize you in water. Come on now. Anyone else before I pray? Anyone else? Don't leave here without knowing Jesus. Tomorrow, you might have not have a tomorrow. Two weeks ago today, two weeks ago today, I had to go back to Colorado and bury my father. I was doing his funeral two weeks ago today. Never expected him to die. But one minute we're here and the next minute we're gone. Don't have no regrets but accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior now. Anyone else? I'll wait one more minute for you. Yes, come on up. I see you coming up. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. 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 All right. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to pray with you individuals up here right now. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus. Oh, come on. I need to hear. Dear Jesus. Thank you for loving me so much and caring about me so much that I am willing to stand here tonight. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all my sins, all my faults, and all my shortcomings. And I receive you into my life right now to be the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I will do my utmost to serve you, to walk with you. Lead me by your hand. Show me the way in which to go. And I know that you won't leave me and you won't forsake me. And I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And now, and now I am saved. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering tonight. God bless you. Come on, can we give Willie a, a big round of applause? Before we go, someone say next Wednesday. It's the grand finale of our outdoor service. Gavin Tate's going to be bringing a powerful message from God. I'm telling you right now, you do not want to miss next Wednesday. It's going to be powerful. We're going to see the power of God move out here. We're going to see breakout of, the, of God's love out here. Plus, we're going to have a little more goodies, some carnival snacks out there, some more goodies. Kona Ice will be here, just some goodies out there. But right now, 
people that are getting prayed for, that are getting saved, altar workers, once they get prayed for, if they want to get baptized tonight, if anybody wants to get baptized tonight, we have a team of people ready for you. The pools are ready to go. You may be saying, I want to get baptized tonight. Then come on over to our pools. Take them over. Once you pray for them, take them over to the pools and let's get baptized. You're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus.